Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here today. We are continuing our nerdy, nerdy, nerdy series on the four principles of soil health supported in part by a grant from Southern SARE. And this video is gonna cover disturbance and I'm gonna go in directions you probably don't expect me to go. Uh, so hold on to your cats. Are you sure it's cats? Doesn't seem right or safe. One obligatory note here, this video is indeed part of a series, but you do not have to watch all the videos in this series in order or watch them all at all. But essentially, I'm using this series to dive a little deeper into the four basic principles of soil health as outlined by Conservation Agriculture, Captain Planet, probably, and Mother Nature herself. Keep the soil covered as much as possible, keep it planted as much as possible, disturb it as little as possible, and diversity is not the worst of Not sure that one works. Like I said, today we're going to talk about soil disturbance uh, and disturbing it as little as possible, which I think is a really important topic because, well, it's possible we're almost all a little bit wrong about what disturbance is and what it means to the soil. So let's do it. First things always first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you're awesome how it works. Also, if you're enjoying this series and want to do a deeper dive, please consider picking up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook, from notillgrowers.com. I specifically designed the book around these principles. Anyway, buying it from us supports our work, so yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's talk disturbance. It is a complicated subject, and it is also largely maybe misunderstood, possibly even by the people who originally came up with these primary principles. This is because disturbance is not inherently a bad thing. Let me say that again, even coming from someone on the no-till growers channel with emphasis, no, actually screw emphasis, with science and nearly unlimited historical precedence, disturbance is not inherently a bad thing because disturbance is just a part of nature. It's part of all ecosystems. For one, microbes, plant roots, fungal hyphae, and earthworms, plus things like moles and voles, but also pigs and birds, fires, volcanoes, are constantly disturbing the soil, like all over the world, all the time. I always say that if you were to take a cross-section of healthy soil and film a time-lapse over the course of, I don't know, 20 years or so, it would not look static. It would look like it was churning. And that's not a negative feature of the environment. It's a necessary one. Indigenous people from all over the world have, and still do, employ what we call disturbance. Indigenous Americans, for their part, employed various forms of disturbance all over the country to create highly robust and biodiverse ecological systems, rich with food for them and abundant flora and fauna. Indigenous Americans in the West used fire as a form of managed disturbance for many years, and as a result created a profoundly heterogeneous environment. Though, of course, I'm not necessarily recommending you use fire here. Please follow all the local laws and common sense. But anyway, indigenous Americans also opened up small plots of soil with sticks or by hand or with animal bones for planting diverse gardens and scattering seeds that they needed for food or basket making or medicine or building materials or whatever. And the soil wasn't worse off from this. Those small intentional soil disturbances over the course of several millennia created an extraordinarily rich and bountiful environment. So it was exactly the opposite. There are accounts from early colonists, in fact, describing the forests and meadows when they first saw them like big, beautiful gardens, because they were. That environment they were admiring was all intentional and a really incredible demonstration of what good soil stewardship looks like. And it involved and still involves in native communities some amount of disturbance. And I go on that micro rant all to perhaps help reframe the average view of Native American agriculture pre-colonization, and also to point out how they were living permaculture long before permaculture was a thing. But also to say that for growers to be good at what we do, we have to reevaluate our views on what is disturbance versus what is tillage. That is to say, we need to clearly differentiate between beneficial biological disturbances that positively influence soil health and biodiversity versus negative biologically detrimental disturbances, i.e. tillage. Because the soil may actually require and benefit from some small calculated disturbances from time to time in order to photosynthesize well and create robust biodiversity. Let me explain. In the last video, I went big nerd on the importance of living plant roots and photosynthesis because, well, as a market gardeners, managing photosynthesis is kind of what we do. But almost no soil condition can slow a crop down and effectively limit photosynthesis more than compaction. Compaction is when soil particles become so crushed together that the soil 
basically just becomes too difficult to penetrate for both water and plant roots and air, which is of course not good because plants and soil alike both need water and air. In fact, gas exchange, which is just gases coming into the soil and gases going out of the soil, is highly important to soil and plant health because uh, there are many microbes in the soil who release carbon dioxide, which you know the plants need for photosynthesis but also alcohols and other toxic gases and those gases need to be able to escape the soil if these gases get trapped in the soil say because of compaction layers they can harm or kill the plant roots sometimes what happens is that a deep compaction layer often caused by poorly timed mechanical tillage restricts water penetration so the water puddles up and encourages anaerobes uh, anaerobes aren't inherently a bad thing many anaerobes are critical to soil health and plant nutrition but when they proliferate they can denitrify the soil. A fancy way of saying they can consume the nitrogen and turn it back into atmospheric nitrogen, AKA the really inaccessible nitrogen if you're a plant that's all around us all the time. So these organisms in large quantities can denitrify the soil and produce toxic gases and thus the plant roots become rooted in toxic stew. And let me emphasize here, plant roots are none too fond of toxic stews. They are decidedly not in the Hexus fan club. All good environmental videos have and gully references that is a fact so it is our role as growers to do something about the compaction you know anywhere that it exists to ensure robust photosynthetic activity <music> to begin with in terms of determining compaction what your compaction issues are. There is a tool called the penetrometer that you can buy to measure compaction, uh, but check with your local extension agents first to see if maybe someone there will, ha will come out and do that work for you. Um, because although the penetrometer is an excellent tool, it is not cheap. An easy, though certainly less precise method is to simply use a piece of rebar or something similar just to see how easy it is to sink that tool into the soil. Literally push it into the garden beds. If you can penetrate, I don't know, 12 to 16 inches or roughly 30 to 40 centimeters deep without a great deal of uh, resistance, that's generally a good sign. But if it's difficult or the tool just stops a couple inches in, the safe assumption here is that so too will your plant roots. And that level of compaction uh, should be addressed. Compaction on the surface from things like rain, which is notably one of the greatest compaction causing elements uh, because rain is super heavy. I'm sure you know this. In fact, an inch of rain over one acre of soil weighs roughly 113 tons. Okay, maybe the source on that one is a Google search, but rain is undeniably heavy. Anyway, surface compaction from things like heavy rainfalls on freshly tilled soil is generally addressed with well-timed cultivations but is also easy to prevent in the first place with mulches and living plant roots, and of course by not churning and exposing the soil. Remember, surface compaction is what traps those toxic gases. Deep compaction from improper tillage or poorly managed livestock, however, is a little more difficult to remediate and will generally require some intervention on your part to address with any sort of rapidity. For this job and on our scale, I often personally prefer using the broad fork while I'm building new garden bed and in between crops for the first few years. This tool just lightly pops the soil and allows the roots and moisture to penetrate deeper and allows for better gas exchange. I love the broad fork. It is a very controversial tool in the no-till community, but it does not invert soil layers or chop up worms or and break up all the fungal hyphae it just opens up the soil enough for living plant roots to break through that hard pan you like analogies i like analogies so let's get analogous real quick even if that's not exactly how you use that word you can kind of think of reasonably healthy soil like a giant city a sustainable one of course naturally it has all the infrastructure like pipes and housing and tunnels and so on the residents obviously are the soil life but compaction would be like having a giant wall around that city where none of the waste can escape and the city cannot expand, the place just becomes a toxic, disease-ridden metropolis. So the Broad Fork helps break down that wall without completely destroying the city. And though there will be some collateral damage to the infrastructure, the end result is that the toxicity can escape and the city can easily rebuild and expand. Um, use this Broad Fork correctly for long enough and you will find the soil no longer needs that intervention. Uh, it doesn't prolong or worsen the problem of compaction like many mechanical tillage approaches do, which tillers obviously do significant damage to 
our poor little city infrastructure, demolishing the aggregates and forcing the microbial population to use a lot of the energy, i.e. soil organic matter, um, to rebuild, the broad fork is gentle and it's effective. Um, when coupled with living plant roots and microbial inoculants, like compost teas and compost and extracts, etc., tools like the broad fork are on a larger scale, perhaps properly employed subsoiler um, instead of a broad fork, but either way, tools like these help to repair the soil. They don't expand the issues. Like I said, they address the problem. That's the human role in all of this. We don't grow food. Plants grow food. We assist the plants. We are the stewards. So can the soil be decompacted biologically? Well, the good news is the answer is a rather clear and definitive eventually, and if employed well. Indeed, plants and microbes and earthworms and voles and all the soil life can and do do some of the best work of decompacting soil, but it is just really slow. Um, for plants alone to break up compaction, it may take a few years in a mildly compacted situation or a decade or more in a rough compaction situation. So unless you can afford that many crop losses or poor performances or simply to allow the cover crops instead of cash crops to work the soil for a year, it is best for everyone and everything involved for you to find a reasonable way to address the compaction layers alongside the crops and the living plant roots. Anecdotally, one trick I've been utilizing to seemingly good effect is to broad fork cover crops in situ, meaning while they are growing at around eight inches tall or thereabouts, um, I just go through a, with a broad fork and lightly pop it up. This will not kill the cover crop, obviously, but will open up the soil a little better for better root penetration. I also like just employing as many cover crops and ground covers as reasonably possible, like this sweet alyssum uh, beneath the tomatoes here. I, I lightly broad forked this bed in March. I then planted both the tomatoes and sweet alyssum in April, and they have both been growing all summer without issue. Uh, that little ground cover from the sweet alyssum is working the soil and bringing in pollinators and beneficials for roughly seven months in our climate. Uh, the tomato roots are digging deeper and deeper and mining nutrients. Uh, the downside is that the sweet alyssum seems to also attract some brassica pests and will put down a lot of seeds, so be conscious of that if you use this technique. But this bed will go until fall and the soil structure will continue to improve all the while. What started with a light broad forking, notably complemented by light compost mulch and compost side dressings, has resulted in a now lovely soil. That's what proper disturbance does. So of course disturbance can become tillage, but tillage is not necessarily inherent in all disturbance. I've heard people, for instance, say that there are can't be such thing as no-till because the act of transplanting a crop or the act of pulling a carrot disturbs the soil and is thus tillage. But to think that way is kind of to lose the plot. Uh, transplants immediately fill the soil with photosynthesizing plants and a carrot before it was pulled spent the last 50 to 80 days pumping in carbon and feeding the microbial life. And then when you pull that carrot, air can better penetrate because of the pocket it leaves behind. There is not damage there, it is literally the opposite. So my proposal here, and in the Living Soil Handbook, is that tillage, for its part, is anything we do to the soil that causes long-term damage, creates more compaction, reduces soil organic matter, pollutes the soil and water by leaching nutrients like nitrates and phosphates, and so on. Conversely, disturbance, when employed properly, is what we do to get the soil where it needs to be to support plant and soil life and biodiversity. The disturbance may do a little damage in the short term, but ultimately leads to healthier soil. And even a tiller can do that work in severe cases of compaction, especially when coupled with composts. But generally, you want to make sure that whatever disturbance you're doing has a purpose and will lead to long-term improvements in soil health. So with all of that said, I think I would lightly modify the principle of disturb the soil as little as possible, often stated as minimize soil disturbance, to something like avoid disturbances that cause long-term harm to the soil and reduce disturbances as soil improves. Not as much of a ring to it, I'll admit, but definitively more accurate. Uh, just endeavor to do what you need to do in your context to help the plants do their thing. Do not worry about how people define tillage or no tillage or disturbance or whatever. Dogma is sort of the anti-principle of soil health. There's a reason each principle ends in as much as possible. Your soil city won't care about those semantics. It's all about intention. And what is your goal with the disturbance that you're doing and how will it improve the soil for the long haul? That's what it all boils down to. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and questions about disturbing the soil uh, as little as possible, or what I said before. I think I have one more video in this series. In fact, 
next week. If I can make it happen, I'll put that up. We will be discussing the importance of diversity in all of this, including animals. I get lots of questions about that. Big thanks to Southern Sarah for the support. Also, big thanks to our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash no-till growers and to everyone who has purchased the Living Soil Handbook from no-tillgrowers.com. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video and stay tuned for the final installment of this series next week, I think. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.